Hello everybody and welcome back to LMM. If you're enjoying what you're seeing on the channel at the moment, the links to our social media are coming up on the screen now. Today, we've returned our glorious British summer day to the Apedale Light Railway, home of over a hundred locomotives. And you guys might remember that they invited me up not that long ago, sometime last year, to take out, well, a shed on railway wheels. And it turns out that they feel a little bit bad about this because they offered another locomotive to make it up to me and say, come back and we'll give you something that you're really going to enjoy. And so I've turned up here. And then they said, before we show you the locomotive, you've got to be blindfolded. And that, this concept fills me with absolute dread. So, Welcome to Lorigo's Loco and um, what we've got to do today. You can look now. Is this some kind of a joke? Is what I'm reviewing behind this? Huh? I strongly dislike steam outline locomotives, things that are pretending to be a steam engine when they're not. I particularly hate steam outline locomotives which weren't built as steam outline locomotives, things that were converted into something else. This here is Merlin. And Merlin, as you might be able to tell, is a bit of an abomination. It is made to look vaguely like a steam locomotive, or at least a steam locomotive that has been described by somebody who's seen it to somebody who has never before seen a steam locomotive in their life. In regards of, yes, it has a black round thing at the front. It has a chimney. Sometimes they have a funny bit on top. It has a dome, which clearly the person has never seen a dome. Oh, and yes, tanks that come off the side and it has cylinders. And actually, to be honest, the slide bars down there, are, that's pretty good, I have to say. The slide bars are the best thing about this entire conversion. The rest of it though, it's just, it's horrific. It's absolutely horrific. I might have mentioned that there are over a hundred, let me just stress that, over 100 locomotives based here. And out of that 100 locomotives, of all of the locomotives in the collection, I could have taken out this, this one. It's made of wood for God's sake. It's not even made of metal. It's just it's wooden. It's a wooden steam locomotive, but it's not even a steam locomotive. It's a wooden pretend steam locomotive. I mean, what was anybody thinking when this thing was made? I just, this is going to be a first because this is going to be a locomotive that I do not like. And I rather suspect by the end of this, I will continue not to have liked. It's just horrific. This is Hudson LX1001 of 1968. And yes, that's right, I said Hudson, not Hunslet or Hudswell, Hudson. Now, the name Hudson may well be familiar to you. Hudson themselves were a builder of basically everything railway. They made rails, rolling stock, anything you can think of to go alongside of, apart from locomotives. They were quite often in partnership with the well-known locomotive building company, Hunslet, with the resulting locomotives being rebadged as Hudson Hunslets. They would come to them, they had a new badge stock on them, and they went out as part of the complete package. However, the locomotive that they kind of were selling as their default package by 1960 was rather, well, outdated. And Hudson weren't happy that Hunslet were working fast enough on a replacement. Oh no, they decided that they had all the expertise and all the knowledge required to, in fact, build themselves a new locomotive which would be superior to anything else on the market. And yes, it is this behind me what they came up with. When this thing was originally designed, it was 
quite advanced. It features such heavy features as a hydraulic drive. Everything that Hunslet before had been making was diesel mechanical. So this was a step in the right direction for something that was a bit more controllable and a bit more upmarket. The problem is though, that by the time that this thing actually came around in 1968, the, the kind of desire to have narrow gauge locomotives was rather waning. In fact, this is the main reason that Hunslet themselves had been reluctant to come up with a new design. People didn't really want narrow gauge railways anymore. Everything was being replaced with a plant like we see today, diggers and dumper trucks and road, of course, with tires based plant. Railways were in decline. So when this thing came out, there wasn't really the huge demand of work for it. And as a result, only two of this design were built. And as luck would have it, the trust here owns both of them. It owns this one's sister, number two, which is in original condition, and this one in its rebuilt. Now, I have said it, but I'll just restress. This did not leave the factory looking like this. No. Now this thing went on hire to the national grid. You see, the old railway tunnel at Woodhead is now full of cables and it's quite long and there is a railway that runs in between it so that you can service said cables. Now there is one slight problem with it working there. You see the Woodhead Tunnel is about three miles long and this thing has a top speed of, wait for it, wait for it, it's two miles an hour. It would take this at full throttle over an hour to get from one end of the tunnel to another. And as you can kind of imagine as a business trying to operate with something like this, well, the national grid was less than impressed. And the pair of locomotives lasted just a few months. Safe to say, most people weren't really impressed with this thing. And for Hudson, finding a buyer for these powerful but slow locomotives proved to be a bit of a challenge. You see, most people don't want a locomotive that you can walk faster than. It does tend to be a little bit useless. But this one got sold to the dredging and construction company of Kings Lynn. You see, its slow speed meant that it was actually quite useful for trudging alongside the dredging machine and taking away the spoil. That actually did have a use, but not for very long. You see, putting a railway alongside some area of water you're dredging isn't really the best way to do when you can just do the same thing with a lorry or a dump truck. So it was rather short lived. And by 1976, it was for sale again. And this time it was reported that it was going to Saudi Arabia. But at some point, we don't really know when, the deal fell through and the thing was never sent. Presumably the buyer asked the question of, how fast does it go? And when was told it was two miles an hour, went, no, why would I want that? So it kind of kicked around again. And then a new buyer was found. And this kind of happened. This thing went to a pleasure railway in Pendine in Wales, you know, the home of the famous Pendine Sands. And being a pleasure railway, they wanted it to look like a steam train to get all the tourists. And so it had a version of this body put onto it. This isn't how it originally looked under its first conversion. No, no, that was something a, a little more basic, um, but it was still pretty terrible. And it was there for, well, not that long in truth. In 1985, it changed hands again, this time falling into the ownership of Canary Borough Council. And it's under their ownership that in 1986, it received its current body shell. And it's worth noting that underneath all of this horrific exterior, it still actually has all of its original body shell from Hudson. It really hasn't been mucked around with that much. It's just kind of been laid on top. And taking this back to how it used to be wouldn't be that difficult. After they had converted this thing into its form, it moved again, moving to the Pembury County Park Railway, which sounds lovely, but it actually ran around a old Royal Ordnance factory. And this thing continued to trundle around there until 1997, at which point it entered preservation, going to the Devon Railway Centre. And then it didn't really do anything and was sold into private hands. And the owner was obviously so enamored with it that he gave it to the railway here. Meaning that the trust have the quite amazing and rare thing of owning an entire production run of locomotives having this and its sister together, which is something quite special. And it was decided that as they had its sister in original condition, it wouldn't really help to tell any story or expand upon anything by converting this back in fact, it tells more of this thing's history and 
true the history of many preserved locomotives by keeping it like this. And although I hate it, I kind of understand and approve of that decision. I understand that that's a worthwhile idea to help tell its story by this. I mean, because it served on a pleasure railway, because it was used in that way, it survived. If they hadn't been found a use for it, for it to actually do something and enter revenue earning service, this thing would have been scrapped years ago. So it's important, I think, to keep it like this. The little green monstrosity here weighs about two tons, but thanks to its very low top speed, it means the gearing is actually in its favor. I'm not exactly sure what it will pull, but the Ape Dale Light Railway volunteers say they're pretty sure that they could couple everything together, and that is over 400 items of stock. And they think this would just walk away with it, because it's just will. It's quite a powerful thing. It's deceptive, but it's quite powerful. Uh, while we're at the back, we see that it has this added on coal bunker, which is wonderful because it comes almost in line with the rear buffer, which has had to be brought out slightly to make it fit so that you can actually couple stock up and not hit this piece of tat. Now, from your distance, you may be able to see this fake coal in here and go, well, it doesn't look too bad. That's maybe a highlight of the conversion. The closer you get, the worse it gets. They are just pieces of stone painted black. It's it's truly, truly horrifically bad. Helped, and I think the final kind of icing on the cake of this bit of horrificness is the fact that there's no glass. It's just floating around. I mean, surely, don't get me wrong, it would be horrible in there if there was, but it kind of looks nasty and cheap. I think that's how I feel about it. It just looks cheap and nasty. It's like when you go to Poundland and you see a train set for sale there, which is for a pound, and you go, that's cheap and nasty. That's kind of this. This is the full-size prototype of one of those cheap and nasty toys. One of the few things about the whole design that they've actually put a bit of time and effort into to make it look like a steam engine is giving it proper-ish looking cylinders that have got these little screws around the outside to look like rivets. And of course, this one has got a working cylinder cox. Yes, that's right, the exhaust is here. So when you're going along, all your exhaust comes out of here. You could have thought they might have rooted it up the chimney, but no, it comes out of a hole crudely cut in the side here. It's pretty abysmal. And both this one here and the other side are both badly dented. Lots of people have used it as a step to stand on there to be able to get over the side of the stupid tank to get into it. There is, of course, one good thing about this design, and that is that it, it does all just come apart. Pulling away this handy access panel, which is also a breather hole to get some air into it, reveals the PETA two-cylinder diesel engine, which has a horsepower of about eight and a half for your standard horses. Now, it's all rather squeezed in there, and it's all quite nice, but I do recognise, for instance, the decompressors on the top are identical to that on my dump truck, because, of course, it is a PETA engine. The engine itself is tiny. The main amount of space taken up in here is the hydraulic oil tank, the reservoir for that. Apart from that, there's not really much to see in here at all. And, of course, it's ideal for conversion into a steam outline locomotive because it's indeed an air-cooled engine. There's no way we have to try and root a radiator and disguise that in part of the body. No, it's, it's fine as it is, as long as there's a little bit of ventilation. I mean, I'm actually amazed that it doesn't overheat, considering it's just the grill down there that's all it's got for ventilation. But uh, apparently it works fine. So I suppose, having had a quick gander at the mighty beating heart of this abomination, I should clamber inside and let's have a look at the control systems. Uh, there is, of course, no graceful way to get into something like this. You have to kind of do this and stick your head out and then reverse and sit yourself down. That, of course, is why there's no glass back there, because you need the space to turn around. Now, some things that you kind of are a challenge to get into, once you have sat down inside, you're like, Oh, this is kind of comfortable. I feel like I sit. This just, I do not feel like I'm meant to be in here. This is remarkably uncomfortable. And I feel like a dog that can't quite get settled. That's how I just constantly try to adjust and find something that feels comfortable in here. It may be, in fact, the single most uncomfortable locomotive I've ever got into. But on the plus side, the controls in here are rather simple. Here we have forward and backwards. So 
there's a little lock here that comes around when we are sat, so you can't do anything. We knock that off like so, and now if I want to go forward, I pull it in this way direction, and if I want to go backwards, I push it in a that way direction. This is also basically my brake. By doing this slowly, it slows the drive down and decreases our speed. If I do want to try and go faster, I have a throttle, which is this one here. And that's about it. Down below me here, this is my handbrake, which I is in kind of, it's just not in a particularly good place, I find. And then I've got an ammeter here to find out if I'm actually charging. And I've got my oil pressure gauge here to know if my engine has got oil. And that basically brings us to the end of what's in the cab. I have a hook here so I can hang up my hat. Or, or I can also hang up the token if I want to put the token there. And that's about it. I do at least have a roof over my head if the weather turns less than pleasant. Visibility out the back is pretty good apart from I can't see anything because I've got this stupid bunker on the back. So I can't actually see when I'm buffering up. And visibility out the front is pretty bad to be honest because there's a pretend steam engine block in my view and i'm not even on the edge of the cab like there is a decent shelf i mean it's quite pleasant that there is a shelf here where i can put all sorts of knickknacks wonderful things but it is completely in my way for doing anything and looking out of there finally of course down here i have my stop pull cord now that really does bring us to the end of all the controls on this. It is a remarkably simple locomotive. I suppose that's what they were going for, something that was simple and easy to operate. So with that, let's uh, pull off the rest of the panels of this and go and do the prep work. One of the few good things about this locomotive is that when Hudson designed it, they were moving with the times. They knew that people no longer wanted to spend half hour in the morning trying to prep a locomotive. So they made it relatively easy to prep. To start off with, all you have to do is reach in here and pull out the oil filler cap, which is conveniently also your dipstick. And that, as that does have some of the black stuff on it, we can put that back and that concludes the prep on this side. Now we wander around to the t'other side. Now obviously all of this would be a lot easier if it didn't have all of this gubbins on top of it. Next, we pop this off for our diesel tank and we drop in, yes that's right, the coupling rod, the coupling pin and pull it out. And that now confirms that we do indeed have diesel on it. Next up is this, which is the hydraulic tank reserve. So we undo this and that reveals that, yes, we do indeed have hydraulic oil, which is kind of important for a hydraulic drive. Goodbye coupling pin. So screw this back up. And then while we're on top, we can try and reach across to these, which are very familiar, and pull the decompressors up. And then dropping down to here, we have two levers in here, which are our cold start primers. So on a cold day, like today, obviously, we can pull those out and prime the engine. That concludes prep. So we can now turn the key and see if it will fire up. So let's see just what this mighty machine will do. I'm taking the handbrake off now. I have been pre-warned by the railway that it's slow. And I've seen it before, and if you guys saw when we came up here to join in with the Eightdale Railways Gala, we took it for a run and it was, well, we saw it going past, slow. So, uh, honk, honk. Right, slowly we feed across the, the, uh, the directional control, which is also the throttle. Oh, that's a beautifully smooth hydraulic transmission. That's very, very controllable to get us moving. Nope, no, that is, that is it. That is as far as that goes. So my only chance for this to pick up some speed is if we open the throttle a bit more. That sounds better. So what it's done is it's made more noise, but it hasn't actually increased how fast we go by much at all. This is, this is slow. This is pathetically slow, in fact. In fact, I don't think I've ever come across another locomotive that has such a absolutely pitiful top speed. 
I own model railway locomotives which will go faster than this. I own model railway locomotives that will go faster at a scale speed than this. This is just terribly so. Why? This hasn't been modified. This is as fast as this is designed to go. Who put this together in their right mind and went, oh, this is going to be a fine top speed for a locomotive. It's basically unusable for the fact that I should be halfway down the line at full, I should be at the other end at full throttle on basically anything else in the Eight Dale Railways collection. I should already be there rather than a quarter of the way down the line. It's just, that is it. There is, there's no more. I'm giving it all it's got. And it just makes noise and trundles along. to get on to before anything else is I feel ridiculous driving this I'm in my blues as I would be if I was driving any other locomotive but I just feel kind of daft because it looks so ridiculous being steam outline with all its city bits and it's not even a good steam outline it's someone who vaguely described what a steam engine should look like and somebody else cobbled together a body shell and I just feel like a bit of an idiot, really, driving this, all dressed up. I look like somebody who's put on a tux to go to, like, a disco. It just feels... feels wrong, somehow. Now, the ride in here, also, well, I don't really feel that it has any work in suspension. The track here at the Eddell Railway is absolutely superb. It is some of the best narrow-gauge railway that I've ever driven on. It's super smooth. But I still feel every single rail joint. And there is absolutely nothing in the cab to make it more comfortable for me at all. No, it is basically deeply unpleasant. There is this shelf that you can see just behind me here. And that cuts right into my back. So I can, yes, I can lean like that and lean backwards. But it means that it is just awfully uncomfortable in my back. It is very bad. The seat also has no comfort at all. There is no cushioning, no anything. It is just a piece of wood in here. And I'll be honest, I've driven up and down a couple of times now. And I'm now kind of supporting myself with my arms to try and protect my poor back and backside. The exhaust fumes also kind of drift lazily across into the cab so you get a nice flavour of exhaust fumes it's it's terrible it's absolutely terrible I mean there's the concept here that something could have been taken from this and you could have made a good engine out of this if it had something on this gearbox to give you a high speed like so many other engines I've driven where you get it to speed and you have a second lever to change the gear or to change over the hydraulic drive and it gives you more speed but it's just uselessly slow. I mean, its only real use would have been a pleasure railway, as it was designed to be, you know, as a pretend steam engine going around an amusement park. And even still, it's slow. And it's uncomfortable. And my visibility at front is totally ruined by the fact that there is a pretend steam engine. There's a, a chimney and a dome kicking out the front, so I have lost everything on that side of the cab. I've got no idea what's going on over there at all.
pretend tank comes forward, which also blocks my forward visibility, so I can't see my front buffer beam. I can't really uh, stick my head out the back of the cab. I mean, I can if I'm a gymnast who's good at doing the flexibility stuff. But I can't really look out of there. Equally, I have to lean so far forward out of here that I have to be double jointed to be able to look out what's going on that side. It's just terrible. I don't think there'd ever be a locomotive that I featured on the channel, which I would just think it's awful. But here we are. It's awful. And I can understand why people don't really want to take it out because it's so slow. It's so uncomfortable. I mean, if we took it anywhere else to some of the other railways I have been to and visited, where the track is less than perfect, this would be awful as it bounces and crashes. And I particularly do not want to take this thing out onto the field railway here at the Eggdale Railway. No, sorry, that is, that is something that I am not particularly interested in. I think it's because I've got a conception of what it should be because it kind of looks like a pleasure vehicle I kind of feel that the cab would be slightly more pleasant to be in rather than deeply unpleasant which is where we are it's just it's uncomfortable it's slow it looks horrible I haven't even really covered that in this little rant of just how unpleasant the thing is to look upon he's got this horrible I just it's just a monstrosity. Off, oh, found a joint in the rail here. Oh. It's just, there's, there's lots of engines that we play with in preservation that we think, oh yeah, this has got a particular job and a particular role in preservation. No, no, nope, this is not. This literally has no foreseeable use at all. It's just, it's, this is bad. It's just, it's just awful. Oh, and the throttle delay is terrible. I've just shot it and you have to wait for a few seconds before the engine thinks about what it wants to slow down. I mean, the only other thing I will go back to is how good this hydrostatic drive is. The fact I can just swing it across and it's so, I mean, but I take it back. For something like shunting, this is hugely useful because you have such good control over it. For anything else, it's awful. And of course, there is its sister, which if you want to shunt and look proper, use that. So here we are back at Apedale Station, having taken an impressive 15 minutes to travel from what is a five minute walk away. This thing is, as I kind of touched upon on the driving segment of this video, terrible. It is terrible in almost every single way and has almost zero redeeming qualities. Some things you get on and go, well that's a bit naff really, I didn't really enjoy it, but it's got character it's got personality and you forgive it for its flaws no this is an abomination it is an abomination in the way that it looks it is an abomination in the way it is to control it and it is absolutely useless in the fact that you are overtaken by snails when you're going along i do not mean to exaggerate when i say that we forgot something so i sent my cameraman off to get it and it was quicker for him to walk and then he started walking back to us whilst we were in full power going that way. It is just, it's terrible. I mean, I hate these things anyway. Steam outline locomotives just annoy me, especially when it's something that's been converted for something that actually is quite a good looking locomotive into something which is, have you ever seen a steam engine that looks like this? It's just, it's just a little bit horrific. That's how I feel about it. It's a little bit horrific. But it has been quite an experience to drive it. I'm quite glad to have had a drive and understand how lots of the volunteers at the Ape Dale Light Railway feel about it. And I, it's good to be able to understand that. And yes, I have enjoyed it. It's been an experience and I have enjoyed doing it and taking it off my list of things to do. And with that, a super massive thank you to the Ape Dale Light Railway for having us back and setting us up with this thing. And of course, to the Mosley Trust 
who kind of operate and overview the whole thing. So a massive thank you to those guys. If you want more information on either of them, then the websites are in the video description. Also, if you maybe want to come along and learn how to drive, well, maybe not this one, but some of the other locomotives that are around here, because there's over a hundred of them based here, then they're always looking for more volunteers and there's information in the video description on how to sign up as well. And with that, guys, yeah, I'm gonna, I don't actually want to do this because I could just walk and be done with it, but there we go. But if you have enjoyed this one, how about clicking over there for another video we've done here at the Eight Dale Light Railway, or down below it for another one of our standard gate videos. Thanks for watching, guys. We'll see you next time. Beep. <laughs>